Hello, this is Jonathan Gardner. We're covering Sergey Ling's Basic Mathematics, Chapter 15, Section 1, what you've all been waiting for, complex numbers. So you might have seen several videos on the internet trying to explain the Euler you know, relation or anything like that. But this, we're going to take a more practical approach here. We're actually going to approach complex numbers with all the elements you need to actually use complex numbers in your day-to-day -day math. He starts off just assuming that the complex numbers exist. And he says the complex numbers satisfy the following conditions. Uh, addition is commutative and associative. And what this means, if you're not familiar with these terms, is that means if you have a complex number z plus another complex number w, then that's going to be the same as w plus z. And then the associative means if you have three complex numbers, uh, z plus w plus x, uh, that's probably a bad letter to use, that's the same as z plus w plus x, right? So it doesn't matter which one you add first. It doesn't matter the order you add in. Same goes for multiplication. It is commutative and associative. And in, in addition, we have distribution of multiplication over addition. What this means is if we have three complex numbers, let's just use A, B, and C. A, B, and C, if we're multiplying the sum by A, so I'm going to B and C by A, then we're going to get A, B, plus A, C, okay? We also have the rule that the real numbers are part of the set. And they don't change their behavior. That means that if you know A and B are real and you add A and B, you're going to get the same result as you always have, even if you consider it as a complex number. So that nothing changes there, thankfully. Uh, we also have 1 is a real number, and it satisfies the property that 1 times any complex number Z is in fact that complex number. We also have 0 is a real number and a complex number. We have 0 times z is going to give you 0, and 0 plus z is going to give you z back as well. It's the identity for addition. There is also an additive inverse. So we have negative z plus z is equal to 0. So we can add numbers that will cancel the other number out. So negative 1 is the additive inverse. of 1. There exists a complex number i such that i squared is equal to not minus 1. i squared is equal to minus 1. Note, however, that the square root of minus 1 under the system is equal to, it can be i or negative i. If you take negative i and square it, you'll also get negative 1. That, this confuses a lot of people, and there's actually people out there on the internet saying that the complex numbers don't work because of this little thing here. Okay. And finally, we have the last and most important rule in the complex plane is that every complex number, z, can be written as a plus bi, where a and b are real. Okay? If you're not familiar with the terminology here, real numbers are all the integers, all the rationals, which are integers divided by integers, and all the irrationals, like square root of 2 and pi, those numbers that can't be expressed as ratios of integers. So the real numbers are now going to be supplemented. We have complex numbers that have all of these curious behaviors. So let's get to it, see what happens because of these things. Okay. All right. We have just as we represent real numbers in the line, we can represent complex numbers in the plane. So let's draw a plane here. And what we're going to do is we're going to call this the real and we're going to call this the imaginary. Okay. Let me scroll that down there so you can see. Okay, so let's suppose that we had any number z equals a plus bi. In which case, in the complex plane, this number would be represented by the coordinates a comma b. Note that a and b are real numbers. They're not imaginary or complex or anything like that. As an example, let's say we had z is equal to 3 plus 2i. So we go 1, 2, 3 over and 1, 2 up, and that would be z, okay? We also have i represented by 0, 1. So this is i right there, 
Okay, one obviously is represented here. Okay, hopefully this isn't terribly confusing. You can play games and figure out where all the different numbers end up on this complex plane. Uh, it is important to note that you can no longer represent complex numbers as a line, and so it's kind of pointless to ask which complex number is bigger than another. It doesn't really make sense in this context anymore. If we had two numbers, z, which is equal to a plus bi, and w, which is c plus di, and we wanted to add these two numbers together, let's take a look at what would happen. Okay, so we write it out this way. We note that there are two real terms. So we have a plus c. And we have bi and di that we add together. So we get b plus di. So the net effect is, if you think of these as points, let's say c comma d, then adding these points is the same as taking the x coordinate of the points, or the real coordinate, and adding the complex or y coordinate together works just the way that you've learned when you add points together earlier in this book. We also have, if we have a real number c, and we multiply z by c, so we take c times z, what's that going to do? Well, you're going to have c times a plus bi, and that's going to give you ca plus cbi, or if you think about this in terms of a point in the complex plane, that's just going to be ca comma cb. Okay, so that's scaling the point out by a factor of c when c is real. If we multiply two numbers together, so let's say we have z times w. What's going on here? We have a plus bi times c plus di. So we distribute these terms. We have a times c. We have bi times c, so I'm going to call that bci. We have a, uh, a times di plus a di and then bi times di. So b, I, b, d, i squared. What's i squared? That's just minus 1. So we have a, c, minus b, d, plus b, c, plus a, oh, these are i's, b, d, and a, d, i. So we can rewrite this a, c, minus b, d, plus b, c, plus a, d, i. Okay? That's how you multiply two complex numbers together algebraically. Uh, rule of thumb here is if you had these as a point, so let's draw this as a point, it's basically going to be a comma b times c comma d, multiplying two points in the plane. We haven't talked about that, what that means yet. And that's going to give you a c, let's make sure I get this right, a c minus b d comma b c plus a d. Okay, so it's going to be the real terms minus the, comp the coefficients of the complex terms, so the real components of the complex terms, or the imaginary terms, and then you're going to take these two inside and outside terms and multiply them together for the, com the imaginary part. As an example, let's do some complex multiplication. So we're going to take z is equal to 2 plus 3i. Can you all see that? Good. And we have w is equal to 1 minus i. The product of z and w together is going to be 2 plus 3i times 1 minus i, which is equal to 2 plus 3i. So these two terms, those two terms, and then we're going to do this, these two terms, minus 2i, and then this is going to be minus 3i squared. And since 3i squared is made of 1, this is going to be 2 plus 3 from this term, and we have plus 3 minus 2 i. Okay, so this is going to be 5 plus i. That is the product of z and w multiplied together. Okay. Let's talk about the complex conjugate now. So the complex conjugate is written with a bar over the top. Okay, and if z is equal to a plus bi, then z with the complex conjugate is going to be a minus bi. Okay, that's what the complex conjugate does. Let's look at what happens when you multiply the complex conjugate together. So we take z times z bar is going to be the same as z bar times z, which is going to be this term squared. And then we're going to have a times minus b and a times plus b added together, which is going to give you zero for that. So there's no i component. 
And then finally, we have these two terms multiplied to get b times minus b squared. And then the i squared as well turns that to a positive. So the end result is this is going to be a squared plus b squared, which you might represent as a, which you might think of as a square of the distance from 0 comma 0, which is the origin, to z in the complex plane. Okay, that'll be useful later. What is the multiplicative inverse of z? Okay, so let's suppose we had w, which is equal to z bar divided by a squared plus b squared. Where did I get these numbers? Uh, just bear with me, see what happens. When we take w times z, we're going to get z times z bar over a squared plus b squared, which is going to be a squared plus b squared over a squared plus b squared, which gives you one. So z, the multiplicative inverse of z is the same as z bar over z, z bar, okay? Another way to think of this is the multiplicative, multiplicative inverse is one over z. So that's what we do. So one more time, z bar over a squared plus b squared. Okay, that's how you find the multiplicative inverse. And you could prove for yourself that there's only one. The way you do it is you say if we had w times z is equal to one, and let's say there was another one, wx, so we have w z times x should be equal to x. Well, that means that w and z times x, if x is the multiplicative inverse of z, then that's just w equals x, because that's one. w times one is w, and so you get w equals to x. So you prove that w is unique. There is no other complex number that you multiply a complex number by to get the multiplicative inverse. All right. Note that this doesn't work. If z is equal to zero, this won't work. Okay, because a and b would be zero, and you'd be dividing by zero. So you can't do that if z is equal to zero. Let's do a little problem here as an example. So we have the inverse of one plus i. What's the inverse of that, right? So the conjugate is one minus i, and a squared plus b squared is two, okay? So one plus i times one minus i all over two should give you one, okay? Another way to think of it, if we took one plus i and we multiply that times 1 minus i, what will we get? Well, we get 1, and the i terms would cancel because you have plus i here and minus i there. You have plus i times minus i, so minus i squared, which is 1. Minus i squared is 1, yes. So we get 1 plus 1, which is equal to 2. And so we want the multiplicative inverse of this. So we say 1 plus i is equal to 2 over 1 minus i or you can just reverse it and say the inverse of this, one minus i to the minus one is gonna be one minus i all over two. Okay, that's another way to do it. Many, many different ways to think about this. Okay, theorem one. Theorem one says, let z and w be complex, then z w multiplied together first and then taking the conjugate of it is the same as multiplying the conjugates together, okay? Also, if you add z and w together first and take the conjugate, that's the same as the sum of the conjugates, okay? Also, if you take the double conjugate, you're going to get the original number back. We're not gonna prove this, it's rather trivial to prove, but this is something I think he leaves as an exercise. So go ahead and do that for fun. Figure that out on your own. Uh, convince yourself of that. Last little thing that we're gonna talk, two little things, three little things, okay? <laughs> One, we sometimes use this, we say real of z, okay? And that is going to give, if z is equal to a plus bi, then this is going to give you a, a real number, okay? And we use m for imaginary of z, and that's going to give you b, a real number. So the real and imaginary parts are in fact real numbers, okay? If we have z is equal to a plus bi, then we take z and add that to the conjugate, what's that gonna give you? That's gonna give you a plus bi plus a minus bi, 
and that's going to be two a's. These two terms are going to cancel, so that's going to be twice the real part of z. Okay, and if we take and subtract the com the complex conjugate, we're going to get a plus bi minus a minus bi. So we get a plus bi minus a, distribute the minus sign, plus bi. So this is going to give you 2bi, which is going to give you twice the imaginary of z times i. Okay? He has it in the book. I think he did it wrong in the book because he says z minus the conjugate of z is equal to 2y is equal to 2 times the imaginary of z. This is wrong because he's forgotten the factor of i. Okay? We also have the absolute value of z. Absolute value with real numbers is just you know flipping the negatives to positives and keeping the positives positive. You can think of the absolute value as the uh, distance from the origin on the number line to that point and the real line. So the real number on the line. In the case of complex numbers, this is going to be the square root of the square, right? So if we take square root of the square, in this case, the square is the x squared plus y squared is the square of the distance from the origin to the point, and so the comp the absolute value of a real number is in fact the distance from the origin. If I can spell distance from the origin, okay, we can calculate the inverse rather easily. It's just going to be the conjugate of z divided by the absolute value of z squared. Okay, so if you know how far the point is from the origin, you can just square that. You can take the complex conjugate and get the absolute, the inverse of that. Another way to calculate this is we, we note that if we take the number times the complex conjugate, that's going to give us the square of the distance. So this is the absolute value squared of z times the complex conjugate. Okay. Last proof, last theorem. This is rather easy to prove. This is called two, theorem two in this section. He says the absolute value of complex numbers satisfies the following properties. If z and w are complex numbers, so z and w are complex, then the absolute value of z times w is equal to the absolute value of z times the absolute value of w. This is rather an interesting result, actually. If we sum z and w and take the absolute value, then that is going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of z plus the absolute value of w, okay? For the proof, he just has one line here. He says if we take z w squared, that's going to be the same as taking z w times the complex conjugate of z w, right? Which is the same as z w, the complex conjugate of z, the complex conjugate of w, and so that's the same as z z bar W, w uh, I'm sorry, times w, w bar, which is just the absolute value of z and the absolute value of w squared. And then you can take the square to both sides. These are real numbers. So you get z, w is equal to z, w. Okay? This one is the triangle inequality. It says that the distance between two points if there's a third point in between those two points that may or may not be in the line between those two points, then the distance from, from point A to point B is always less than the distance from point A to that third point and the third point to, this, to B. So that's the triangle inequality. The homework problems are pretty easy. Uh, he doesn't teach anything new in them. Just do them, enjoy them, see if you understand how complex numbers work. Guys, have a great day. Take care and bye-bye. This video was part of my series on basic mathematics by Sergey Lang. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell, like and share this video. You can find me on Discord and support me on Patreon. Thanks a million.